Hi, my name is Chris Duggan. My website is chrisduggan.com, and you're on the Break It Down show. Yeah, I've had Chris come on because, uh, well, a couple of reasons. One, he was on Popping the Bubble uh, during the summertime, and as you guys know, that's my technology show. So I wanted to take a minute to follow up with him on a project he was working on. But before we get to that, Chris is a what they call a serial entrepreneur. So he goes out and he starts companies, builds them up, and then does something with them. Maybe he hires a CEO and he sits on the board and oversees it. Maybe he sells it to you know an extremely large company, but he finds holes and he fills them with with knowledge and most of it's technology based. So. He started a company called BetterWorks that both John and I did a lot of handyman work for, and that's sort of how I got to know who Chris was. Um, but you've done a lot of things, and it's fascinating. One of the things about the Break It Down show is that you get to be Chris Duggan, but you also get to be this entrepreneur guy, and also you've got an affinity for going fast in your Porsche. So we'll cover a lot of ground, but let's talk a little bit about – so you, you got through the – the day-to-day grind of, of uh, getting better works up and off the ground and healthy and going, and then you decided to change speeds and go into this kind of this advisory role. And you advise on a lot of things. You sit on boards. You're always giving advice. But why why this thing and why capture it on your blog? Well, um, so I, by the way, I've, I've been in Silicon Valley now for 19 years, mm. and I've worked in 12 startups. So I've, done, I've had the ups and downs and sideways and really downs and really ups that, you know, that come from being in so many experiences like that. And I guess for me, you know, this year I decided to start a new company. Uh, it's in a, it's in a completely new space for me. It's in the, in the healthcare space. And I had, um, a little bit of time and, um, while I was kind of getting things going and I, I wanted to give back to the community where I've been able and, and, and have been so grateful to, have had so many opportunities to learn and get better and make mistakes and fail and improve. Um, and so I thought, what better way than uh, setting a, a goal for myself? Uh, I'm, I'm very goal driven, by the way. You know, my, BetterWorks is a goals company, so we're all about goals. And and so one thing I, you know, obviously am very passionate about is goal setting. And so I I decided to set a goal for myself for 2018, which was to meet with a hundred entrepreneurs and coach them for 45 minutes uh, and and basically just do a, a free service. It doesn't cost anything. I don't want money. I don't want payment. I don't want advisory stock. I don't want anything. I just want to give advice and um, and people can take it or leave it. It's just one opinion. I thought maybe I could help some people. I could help uh, you know entrepreneurs. I could help minority entrepreneurs. I could help female entrepreneurs. I could help overseas entrepreneurs. And I didn't know what was going to happen with it. I put it out there. Um, I did a little bit of promotion on LinkedIn and kind of, you know, kind of social, social channels, but I didn't really make a big deal about it. And I just started getting all this inbound interest from entrepreneurs all over the world that wanted to tap into um, the expertise areas that I talked about. And, and on the blog, I put out there that, hey, if you want to talk about fin- fin- uh, fun- fundraising, financing, if you want to talk about getting investors, if you want to talk about sales, if you want to talk about go to market, you know, and I put some of my qualifications up there about kind of why I'm qualified to give advice in some of these areas. Um, you know, people really were excited about doing this. And, um, you know, we, we had a really tremendous year doing coaching. Okay, so that begs the question, what did we learn from this? Uh, the, I love the idea of the goal setting, by the way. You take on something big and crazy, and, and when you look at the time it takes for you to do this, you're talking about 5% of your actual work year for the year. And that might sound like a small number, but that's actually an enormous number of time. And that's just your specific time. I imagine you have someone helping you organize this thing, and quickly this becomes a, a fairly, you know, if you took 5% of your pay out, uh, for anybody's pay, they, they'd be hollering like that's too much. <laughs> so this is what you're giving back. So, so thank you for doing that and helping well, out. Actually, you helped uh, out the ladies at uh, Charity on Top, and uh, I also appreciate that because I love to support them. But talk about a little bit about some of the things that came up. What were the common questions? By the way, the, one other thing, one benefit of giving advice um, is that it also keeps you sharp, mm, and right. it helps you. 
when you give advice, it also is a kind of a good uh, opportunity to reflect on the advice you're giving to see if you're also living the advice. It's easy to give advice, uh-huh. but it's hard to follow advice. Yeah. So Let me, before we even go past this, I want to spend a moment in this. So I know that like I, I do a lot of this myself too. I advise on like podcasts and that kind of thing, or or you know I've done a lot of time in conflict zones, so I know a lot about uh, culture, right? And so I'll be talking, and some point during the time where I'm delivering my uh, my my soliloquy and, and making the other person wonderful before it, my brain will switch from helping them to hey dummy, pay attention to what you're saying. <laughs> and it's it takes great, me it's a I've great timed this. it takes me it's less a, than 90 seconds to the point where I'm actually talking to myself instead <laughs> of them not that I'm not paying attention to them but uh, my brain realizes that I'm saying something that I need to do better even if I do it I don't do it very well do you experience the same sensation yeah absolutely it would be I mean a good metaphor would be like if you're kind of saying like oh how do I get in shape oh you should do this you should eat less you should exercise more right and then at some point you're like actually maybe i should be eating less and exercising more so i think it it, it does keep you sharp it uh i do i mean i find it rewarding just to be able to help people and to pass on you know my learnings and i've made many mistakes and i've learned a lot over the last 19 years and so you know the biggest thing that when i when i go into these conversations um that i try to think about is how can i help somebody make your mistakes yeah and and how what could maybe if i could put them in a different direction or just change the angle of their attack a little bit could that could that accelerate their business and save them time by the way just some cool stats i put this on the blog uh but uh for the year um uh you know by opening up the service i had 81 companies reach out to me uh, we actually were able to schedule 71 of those companies for a meeting and, and actually do a call. And so I think like five or 10 just kind of pushed into next year or right. didn't, get, didn't get scheduled. And then there were a total of 110 entrepreneurs that were in those 71 calls. Um, most of them were like single entrepreneur calls, but obviously some had a, a handful of other folks that were from the founding team. And then um, I was able to get 60 of those companies to post on my blog. But I, my, my only request at the end of a call was, if you're satisfied with my advice, please comment on my blog. Right. And so 60, 60 of the 71 posted on the blog. Um, so I don't know if that means 11 weren't satisfied or yeah. just didn't, didn't follow up. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think, you know, I, I was very happy with those stats, you know, over a hundred entrepreneurs participated, you know, it did, it, it, it was, you know, you said 5%. I mean, it was probably something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I was doing a, a couple calls per week and, um, you know, and then you have to do a little bit of prep work. You have to study their company, you have to sure. study their website. Sometimes they send you some materials to review. So it, yeah, it does add up. You know, I was really happy to have had the experience and, and just how positive people were on the blog when they commented. I mean, you can go look, go look at the original blog post. There's like 60 comments. Um, people were really excited, I think, to have gone through this as well. Yeah, it's interesting when you when you think about what you know, you're giving this advice. Did you come across anybody who was skeptical? I mean, there are so many experts out there, right? I'm a life coach. I'm a business coach. I'm a this and that, and and everybody has good intent. But but how do you sort out the knuckleheads and the people that, like you have legitimate you've been involved in so many companies. You've got an MBA from UC Irvine, all of these things that, that give you a real pedigree where people should be like, oh, right now, as soon as we can and not something that they would push off. But uh, have you did you have to, like, provide some kind of bona fides to these people at all? Or was your was your resume uh, and your LinkedIn profile enough I think for them? My LinkedIn was was pretty sufficient i mean yeah. i did i i I'll, by the way also I'm, I'm i'm very i made it really clear on my blog what kinds of advice i can give right and my my kind of areas uh you know of kind of experience are fundraising so i i did i've done two series a two series b one series c raised about 120 million dollars so i can talk about that and uh, you know this is with like big name firms in silicon valley so i can talk about that topic um and learnings from that and number two is I've done sales uh, and enterprise sales and sales management for a really long time, 20 years. And I've interviewed over a thousand salespeople, hired over a hundred salespeople, fired like 40 or 50 salespeople. <laughs> right. 
And, you know, I've met with more than half of the Fortune 500 and done de- thousands of sales deals. And so I can talk about sales. If you want to talk about getting customers, getting your first 10 customers, getting your first 100 customers, getting your first 500 customers, I have experience in d- directly doing that. And so those are probably kind of, you know, the, and, and maybe the third one is just like, uh, you know, go to market or other related topics that might come up, which could be like, how do I hire my first VP of sales? How do I hire my executive team? How do I set goals? Those are like, maybe kind of that third bucket is like miscellaneous. But, but I, at least I was very specific about the, the specific, you know, the types of things I can talk about and other, you know, other things, you know, that maybe people were interested in, you know, besides those, you know, it's not something maybe I have a strong opinion about. You, one of the notes you talk about, most entrepreneurs are really prepared to talk about the topics they wanted to discuss. Did they want to discuss the right topics? Oh, yeah. I think, um, yeah, yeah, 95% of the time they knew what the issues were. Um, and maybe I had to kind of recalibrate or readjust it just a, a, a slight touch. Like, some of the calls would begin by saying, like, you know, Chris, I really want to learn about Better Works and what you did at Better Works and how you started Better Works. And, you know, uh, frankly, you know, like those are kind of maybe they're interesting, maybe they're not that interesting, but they're not stories that are, I think are going to be as directly relevant to whatever that challenges that person's going through. Right. Like if I say, oh, let me tell you, in 20, it was 2013, and you know, and this is how we started the company. So rather than kind of go through that whole history lesson, I would just say, hey, like, I'm, ha- you know, we can talk about that, but why don't we just talk about, like, what's kind of a challenge for you right now? Uh, you know, oh, getting my first couple customers or growing the team or getting funding or, and let's talk specifically about that. Right. And, you know, the fact that I've been doing sales management for like 20 years now, one of the skills that you learn in sales management is you learn to make an informed opinion about a deal or what's going on with a deal with a very limited set of information. You can only ask a few questions like, wh- wh- tell me about the deal, the customer, who, you, who the contact you're working with, their title, what's going on with the deal. You can only ask a few questions and then you have to make, basically make an informed opinion of, is this deal going to happen or not? And so after you've done that thousands of times, you can actually um, diagnose the challenge pretty quickly. Okay. with a reasonable level of accuracy that I think is like a skill that only sales managers have. I was able to use that kind of technique in, in kind of identifying challenges that they were facing and then use that to kind of you know help coach them. I, I'm sort of an anti-PowerPoint guy. So when people are like, let's put together a 45 slide slide deck, I, I, just, I hate it. Because I was in the army, and and gosh, they they beat PowerPoint's usefulness out of me. I just I can't stand it. Is it all about slide decks, or can you move away from that and give more of a, a you know I don't know a, a a living form of the PowerPoint thing? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so let's see. I do think that it depends on where you are in your you know kind of uh, maybe you know kind of company maturity, right? I do think in the beginning you should be asking lots of questions and having conversations with prospects and you're just trying to learn and find out is there like, are they having pains and challenges in certain areas? And then, you know, we're, we're learning to find, we're trying to discover product market fit. I, I, I'm definitely not in favor of like having long PowerPoint, you know, like right. 10, 15, 20 slide decks, but I do think having four or five slides, to kind of like guide a very quick update about like who we are, wh- what we do, why we're here, what we want to talk to you about, and spending like five or ten minutes to kind of kick off a meeting, I think that can be useful. Um, one of the techniques I like to you know kind of coach you know founders on is, and this can work for sales meetings, but it can also work with for investor meetings, is like 25 minutes into the meeting whether you've had like PowerPoints or some demo or whatever, you should be closing the, the laptop, mm. unplugging it from the projector and basically saying, so, well, that's kind of, you know, the update from our side, but now let's talk about what you think about all that. Right. And you should do that. at Like most people do that at minute 58 of the meeting. <laughs> right. They don't do it at minute 25. More than half of the meeting should be about conversation about what they, how they react to the opinions and ideas that you've presented them. And the only way that you can get into that habit is if you literally remember to unplug everything. Because they always say, 
oh, hey, Pete, can you show me that one more thing? Or, yeah. Can we go back to that yeah. one thing you were saying? That if you've unplugged it and you've now taken it away, now it's like you put it in your backpack, it's gone. It's going to allow you to have that conversation. And I think you should, like, every VC meeting should do that. And people don't do it. They love, they love the demo. They love to talk. Yeah. And they, they, they don't kind of like say, well, what do you think about all this? And it's I, such that, a. That was kind of, that's one of the things I talked to, to the, the entrepreneurs about. I love this tool. This is great because it forces you to shut the hell up and, and stop talking and, uh, and get the client to give you more information. You know, because, like, so a lot of my time working overseas, you know, I'm a spy. I'm trying to find things out about them, right? So my job is to not have me talk a lot. My job is to have them talk and to figure out what it get to get them going emotionally so that they'll, you know, start to create and a, um, you and know, my job is to get the worst people on the world to, to trust me and, and talk to me and become my friends. Right. And you don't do that by saying I'm super cool. Like you have some exchange, but yeah, you have to do that. Plus when you put that laptop in that backpack, you do create a little bit of a FOMO, fear of missing out. The people are like, oh, I need to see that slide again. I, I love that technique. I got to think about how, how to apply more of that to what I do in a day-to-day -day basis where I can take away that thing. That's a, that's, that's a clever tool. One thing I found is that, and this is through like thousands and thousands of demos and pitches and meetings and, you know, like <laughs> many years of, of you know of the of, of the startup sales struggle yeah is that you know one one you know the worst thing you could do is like spend 58 minutes doing your powerpoint and demo and then two minutes for questions and then they're like i'm sorry i gotta go to my next meeting that's the worst uh, yeah. okay but but i also think the second worst is like the the newfound kind of let's say solution selling person who is going to like start the meeting with like well before we can you know before we get you know, going, hey, we want to kind of ask you some questions for 15 or 20 minutes. And I, I find that, that that has a pretty high risk of not working. Huh. And what will happen is they'll say, hey, can we just get to the demo? Right. To, and, and they're like, look, we understand you're trying to use solution selling techniques on us. Just get to the demo. Yeah. And I kind of, I don't like, the, I kind of, when I, when I think about it, I, I feel like the metaphor is like, you, you walked in with a jam box. Uh -huh. By the way, we're old enough; we can call it a jam box. Yes. Right? You walk in with a jam box, and they, they, you've kind of set the, the set it there on the desk <laughs> on the table. Yeah. And then you start like, "Hey, can we kind of talk about music? What kind of music do you like?" And they're like, "You know what, Pete? Just dance. Just turn dance. the jam box on and start <laughs> dancing." <laughs> and there's a high risk of when you kind of start to, to open up with these questions. And then, and then you like you. They feel ru you, You're feeling rushed. Yeah. They're trying to get to the. And so, a better thing is to say, "Hey, I, w I just want to level the playing field, open up with who we are, what we do, and maybe even show you a very short demo, just so you can visualize the, yeah. the thing we're trying to solve. Close it at 25 minutes in, and then you say, "Now, what do you think about what you've seen today?" Right. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking back. So I used to work at CDW back in the olden times and I, I, I never quite fit in there, but part of it was because, you know, I've got a, I've got a master's degree like you do. Mine's in business management. Right. And so when you sit across from someone who's trying to business management, one oh one me, you know, without ever having considered my background or who I am or what I do, you know, so now you're sitting across trying to business management, a guy that's got a management degree, that's master's level. And he's a spy and you're going to try to like, you know, pick me apart with questions. And they would they inevitably we get to the thing where they're like, how do you feel this meeting went? I'm like, I think it went shitty. You've undermined me. You've patronized me. You've ignored me. You don't understand what I'm doing. And now I'm going to go back to my desk and make phone calls and fume all day. That's that's the outcome here. And they never knew what to do with that because, you know, they're trying to do the whole like, you know, solution sales business 101 kind of thing. And it was infuriating where like if they had just, you know, spent time being human instead of trying to follow some some program in their head, you get a lot farther. And I, I think you're right. The let's let's get through the stuff we've got to get through. Hey, hi, I'm Pete. Let me open the laptop. Let me show you what we do. And then let's spend some time talking about that. I love that. I think that's a great way to keep it short and not fall in love with. I've lit Chris literally in the last not even the last month, I sat across from somebody who's trying to create a, um, a community interaction 
platform um, for a major corporation, and they, and they work within that corporation, and they sent a slide deck out that had, it must have been 45 slides, and this was going to be their way of presenting to an audience of, of community members. You know, and it's like the last thing they want after working all day, and they come to actually, that you get them to show up to your community meeting, and then you just absolutely hammer them with with slideware. Oh yeah. my God. So, by the way, I'm not saying, and we don't have to take, take, turn this into a whole sales discussion. Yeah, anyway. yeah. So, uh, you know, because a lot of the stuff we didn't talk about with these entrepreneurs was specifically like sales tactics. I'm not just to wrap up this, this, this topic. I'm not saying that you just go in blind and show your stuff without any context or understanding of the sure. customer's circumstance. I'm just saying that like trying to do that in the first 20 minutes and Especially when, like, imagine they give you, like, a room of, like, 8 or 10 or 12 people. Yeah. Everybody clams up. They're not going to, they're, they're all waiting to see who's going to speak first. And sometimes you just go in there, maybe maybe put the jam box on, hit play, show them a couple moves, and then turn it off, unplug the jam box, and say, so what does everybody think about community management? Like, is this yeah. something you care about, you don't care about, a priority, not a priority? Is it going to have any impact if you even solve this problem? Who should care about this? Right. Uh, how do you think you should solve this problem based on what you've seen today? Does that align or does it not align? Yeah. I think you what you've said is basically have a human conversation about the reality of the situation versus just trying to like pitch people all the time. How much of a problem is is confidence in the right areas? You know, one of the things I've learned from popping the bubble is that the entrepreneur often loves their product but they have a, a limited capacity in how to develop an audience or to, to you know, focus on. I've noticed a lot, like people talk about stakeholders, they often forget the main stakeholder, you know, the people that are going to buy and use the, the product. So um, how does the, yeah, when you meter out your confidence, yes, your stuff works, you want to improve it, you're excited about, you know, version 2.2 and all those things, but how much did you have to deal with that? So I think this is a really great question. I think that um, there's a really there's a there should be a really healthy tension between like being confident and assertive about creating a successful company, but like deathly paranoia about what's the right way to solve the problem. Mm. And I think what I what I experienced with these like you know uh, you know talking with these over 100, 100 entrepreneurs is that Many entrepreneurs uh, love to jump to brainstorming solutions and even creating a product for with, with a very specific solution in mind. And my conversations with you know a lot of these folks, what we what we realized is that maybe the solution that they're kind of that they've come up with is the wrong one. Mm. Maybe the problem is the right problem, but they were so quick to jump to the product. By the way, like everybody loves doing this. It's like fun to do too. Like, yeah. Oh, you know, how are we going to solve it? We're going to have this app and we're going to do this and then it's going to do this. And it's <laughs> yes. have these yeah. It's very easy to, I, I think in the product market fit part is the product is the hard part. Like a lot of, there's a lot of pains. A lot, and by the way, some of the, this is, there's also scenarios where they're not going after enough pain. But in many cases, entrepreneurs have found the right types of problems but they had solved it in the wrong way mm. and they were getting a lot of friction. And one of the things I remember like having a conversation with one of these entrepreneurs was when you have product market fit and I've been in companies that have it and I have not had it. And I've even been in companies that have had it and then lost it. Oh. Like, you can have all, all scenarios. The, what you learn is that when you have it, it feels like this tremendous pull on your company. Like you're not trying to sell people or convince them. They're they're calling you. They're buying the product. They want to buy it, and you're getting orders and you're being pulled by the market. Right. And when you don't have it, it feels like you're pushing a tremendous boulder up the hill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not what startups that are successful feel like. Right. And so what you have to do is figure out like how are you gonna what are you gonna it's not about push push harder, is it, not the answer. The answer is usually like find a different hill, find a different boulder, uh-huh. find another loophole to change the dynamic, to to fundamentally change the friction that you're experiencing. 
Yes, you've unlocked a great part of this conversation, and I want to I want to back up a little bit and ask you partly about this part because yeah, the friction and you have the elements, but you don't have the right compound with the elements. So I, I, I love this conversation, but let me go back to the talk about like, you know, the, the, the whiteboarding, the brainstorming and trying to figure the thing out. People love to give the theoretic and strategic and the outcome based things. But I have found as a guy that goes out every day and tries to solve complex problems, you know, in Afghanistan, Iraq, that kind of thing. You know, my thing was is below the tactical level, below what you train for or the actual things you have to do every day. And it's, it's often simple things. Like for me, I had to get out every day and go talk to people and constantly work on my questions to get to information that was useful faster, more efficiently, uh, more precisely and more accurately. Those were the things that I had to work on all the time. So I would I would. You know, in between patrols, I would stay fit by walking around the camp, have conversations with myself, trying to figure out how to get myself into these these areas where someone's compelled to talk to me. Right. Like that's that was the stuff I had to do every day if I had any intention of being tactically proficient, which hopefully and usually not in my case, uh, hopefully led to strategic advancement. You know, like every tactical little win is a little a little bean on the scale for the strategic win. But I know that must resonate with you in terms of CEOs and what they want to do versus like I always talk about where is the work? Like, well, that's where the work is. This Afghan guy won't show up to work. Well, that's where the work is. The work is not in what he produces. The work is in figuring out how you get this guy to show up in a place that's dangerous. He's scared. He's, you know, uninterested in participating in a machine that doesn't need his input. So where where is the work for CEOs? Like, when do they start to lose sight of that? Or do they even have sight of it yet? Well, I think it all depends also like on where what the stage of your company is. In the beginning, are you just trying to find product market fit? Are you trying to uh, later when you're trying to scale and you, now you need like a bigger team and that you need to build the team that's going to scale correctly? Mm. I think there's various stages. Um, but maybe just back to like your earlier question about like confidence versus paranoia. I do think that a lot of CEOs think that this is I, I, I don't want to overly simplify, but I guess I will just for the purposes of the of the of the explanation right imagine a young uh, young ceo first time startup um is on to kind of a problem jumps straight to the solution this is how this is how we're going to build it exactly how it's going to work and then now i'm going to basically go out and meet like a hundred people and pitch them on this yeah and i'm just going to keep like the meetings i'm just going to tell you what what we do here's what we do here's why it's so great here's why you need it and then they wonder why like after the meeting people don't buy or don't don't return their call right and I guess, and, and so I think you have to have a lot of confidence as a CEO, but you also have to have a very strong skepticism or fear or paranoia that have you really discovered the right thing? And what I, what I, what my pattern matching on this was after talking to over a hundred entrepreneurs was, I think a lot of people are finding the, you know, the, the, the pain, many others aren't, we can talk about that too, but yeah. they find the pain, like the pain is. I, we're having a problem with like how we do our contract, so contracting process. Um, but the solution isn't, okay, great. Let me create like this inbox of like a contracting system with a this and the that. It's maybe it's like, well, what, you know, it's kind of, you have to pull at the, at the sweater to kind of pull that thread and you have to get deeper into like, why is that a problem? Maybe it's like a supply chain problem sure. or, and again, I'm just kind of making this up and, you know, part of the, the, you know, every situation is kind of the same, but also very different. Yeah. And, um, you know, but the point is, is like, don't jump to the conclusions, stay on the problem. And what I, what I, what I kind of, what I, what I found was that, um, if they just adjusted something a couple degrees, like maybe it's their message or how they're packaging this thing or how they're going to go after it or, you know, kind of even maybe the set of like features that they're going to kind of offer that what they what they were doing in hindsight looks right, but also look like it was off at the same time. And if they, with, with just a few kind of adjustments, they could actually get to, you know, the promised land. And um, and so like, I guess your job as a CEO is to keep finding out what are those adjustments? What is 
what is the language that we should be using? What's the messaging we should be using to explain our product? Um, what are the most important features? And you know, like one of the things I would encourage folks to do is, if you know, if you're in an early stage conversation and you're trying to find out if your product market fit, don't just pitch them on the product. Maybe say things like, you know, hey Pete, on a scale of one to ten, you know, how compelling is this? You know, that we've kind of shown you today. And what would it have to do to make it a 10? Mm. Like yeah. that, that's going to give you better advice than just trying to sell somebody on what you've done. Yeah. Interesting. So as you're looking at CEOs who are just a little left of that, how do you nudge them? I mean, obviously, you know what you're talking about and you are trying to describe. I was trying to think of a good like a way to describe what you're trying to do. And you're sort of trying to explain how to like how to do tightrope walking or slack lining right and you're like okay uh you gotta really like which is your strong foot okay start off with your left foot and then after that it's a whole lot of balancing and wiggling and terrifying things that you can kind of calm them about you know like okay let me use a race car analogy since we both drive fast um the car can handle more than you can like you're more afraid than the car is going to fail but the car isn't going to fail it's going to stick to the road and but explaining that to somebody who hasn't, you know, gone through and like just think about like when the car starts to to drift and slide and you know in a powerful way, you know that if you continue to roll into the gas, those big old fat tires are going to hook up and it's going to launch you down the road and you're going to go even faster still. So how do you, uh, you know, how you're trying to describe something that's very hard to do. But when if the feeling is right, you can have a lot of confidence that it's working. You're being pulled in because it's so powerful. Yeah, I, I, I love the metaphor, by the way. I mean, Thanks. I think uh, I do. I'm, I'm trying to get more confidence in my car as I go through the corners because, uh, I, you know, the car has way more ability than my foot does. Right. The I guess I, I think in this case, a lot of this is not about getting more confidence okay. to go faster. It's actually like maybe it's actually kind of slowing things down a little bit mm. um, because they're moving at 100 miles an hour, but they're kind of skipping some basics. Yeah. Like, are customers really excited about this? How do you know? And, you know, like, I mean, you know, I, I, by the way, I want to get to like some specifics, like, yeah. you know, without getting into the company, but like, you know, I talked to one company who uh, like had been working on an idea for two years. They had like 50,000 in sales the first year and 30,000 in sales the second year. That does not sound good. All right. That sounds not good. What are we going to do? Like, don't, don't forget my better works experience or my badge rule or what I did at this company or Palantir or whatever. That's right. not relevant. What's relevant is let's talk about why you had 50000 and 30000 Yeah. And let's solve this problem right now in the next 45 minutes. That's kind of the urgency that I had. To, and, you know, by the way, like I try to, you know, I know we, we haven't really talked a lot about examples. So it's kind of some of this can be seem a little abstract. Right. And I try to make my coaching as practical as possible, mm. which is like, let's specifically talk about why this is not happening or what the challenge is or how many, okay, so you, okay, you didn't get any sales. Well, did you talk to people? Did you not talk to enough people or the right. people that you talked to weren't interested? Um, and, and, it, and why weren't they interested? Do we know why they're not interested? What, do we know what they would have been more interested in? Let's get to some very simple ideas to figure out how can we get more money? We need more money this year. Right. Like, like what would have to happen for us to get 500,000 this year yeah. or a million? And, you know, like, is it the product is the wrong product? Is it, are we going after the wrong customers? Are we going after, we're not charging enough. Like I, one, one of the customers I talked to or uh, people I talked to, I said, you, for your customers, you should charge the 10 X your price right now. The price has just gone up 10 X. Hmm. You're charging. It was like a, uh, the price point was like, uh, 3,000 a year, mm -hmm. but, but it was a kind of like a solution oriented sale. Right. I was like, your product now is 30,000 a year. Like, and that could be actually a confidence issue. Like I, maybe I don't have confidence to charge that much. Sure. But I, when we understood the work that they were doing to get these orders and they get three grand after all that work, it just, it doesn't, the economics and didn't the SAS, make sense. The way a SaaS model works, you're just not going to get to 10 million, 20 million of ARR with like these types of orders. Right. And so that, you know, it was like, Hey, we should just charge 10 X. And, um, you know, the, uh, uh, my understanding is that they implemented that and now they charge a lot more money, but <laughs> getting more sales. 
So it's these. I just try to make it very practical and mm-hmm. try to figure out what's the root cause here. What's holding back the order? Okay, so what's holding back the order and you know not charging enough is definitely a, a thing. Uh, I, it's, it's very easy to do because you're not sure what the market is. What about some of these companies are really they they've found a new niche and it's one thing to be first mover, but. If you get there and, you know, I always like to say in terms of sales, no one was like, oh, I hope Pete knocks on my door today so he can sell me a $20,000 solution. You know, that's not like the we're reality. The reality is I'm coming in and we're going to have a conversation and we'll see what happens from there. But when you're a first mover, now it's even harder because, um, I don't know, let's just say that you sell, you know, a widget. But no one's even aware that they need that widget yet. How do you, how do you help companies get past that? We're like, this is great. It's all blue water, but um, you're the only guy on the lake. <laughs> I think I'll come back to like when you have product market fit, uh-huh. it, it, it just, it hums. Okay. People want it. You, it's not trying to convince somebody to like take, you know, a piece of software. It's wow. It's, we are so glad you came by. Right. That's what it feels like. And so the question is, like, how do you discover that? And it, by the way, this is not easy. I'm not, th- none of this is easy. It's very easy to give advice. <laughs> yeah, Anybody right. can give advice. You know, like, this is a b- incredibly hard. And, you know, and, I, and I, it's, I, you know, my, my heart goes out to every entrepreneur that has to battle with this. Yeah. And every startup is delicate and every startup is a, a monumental challenge. But, I guess, you know, maybe the, the summary here is it, like for the, for the companies where they're finding that they're really having a, a roadblock on, on success, it, it's not about work harder. It's about change something and, and kind of go back to first principles mm. on what's something that could be modified. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a huge modification. Like I, I, there was companies I said, you should just stop working on this. Yeah. Um, there was about 10% of them. I actually said that. And I didn't mind to be rude, by the way. I, I sure. don't, I, I'd hate, I, the last thing I want to do is be rude to somebody. But, and I, I kind of prefaced it by saying, like, I, I just want your time is the most precious thing. And I believe that you, you, you can be a successful entrepreneur, but not with this idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go and, you know, keep, you know, today's a new day. Like, work on something new. Don't give up, but abandon this idea because it's not, you know, it's not going to, based on what I see, it's not going to materialize. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that though. What so when you obviously you've got the courage to do that, you've got the know how, like this doesn't seem like this is going to work. You know, you're breaking bad news for them. Were you the first person to tell them this? I mean, not like a doubter, but like an actual yeah, yeah, like, no, that's interesting. Some I think some people said it had validated their intern their inner voice. Uh huh. But that maybe they weren't kind of not really prepared yet to say it out loud. Right. Right. Um some people were in denial. Uh, and basically kind of dismiss the advice. Yeah. Well, failure and will it, cure that, right? I mean, <laughs> well, and maybe I, I, by the way, I could be wrong too. It doesn't, I, you know, like, oh, for sure. Good metaphors. I've had the opportunity to invest in some great companies over the last 20 years. And I also passed on some great investments that I just thought were not going to work out. And it turned out to be massive companies and I totally made the wrong decision. So right. I, I've seen both sides of that, of the of that <laughs> equation from an yeah. investor. Standpoint. Yeah. Like I, for the, I'll just give it again. I try to be practical. I, mean, I really don't like these kind of like abstract kind of conversations where right. it, 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 you know, it, it's hard to kind of, you know, kind of get to the details. But like, as an example, I passed on how we could have been, I could have been a seed investor in house. Um, my wife knows the, the folks over there. They actually shot our house to be in the first kind of like website version of house. Uh And I thought like, I thought who would ever want to go to like some like uh, site with a bunch of like houses on it? Like who would ever do that? (laughs) It turns out it's it's a great idea. (laughs) I was wrong. That happens all the time. (laughs) And so it doesn't mean that I'm right, but I guess what I'm saying is I now have, you know, and by the way, maybe that was a, it's a consumer idea. I don't know much about, the fact that there's like gazillion magazines that yeah. actually solve that problem that it, that needs to be di- you know turned into a digital experience, but at least as it relates to like B two B, I can you know I can understand like what are the objections, what are the challenges, what are mm-hmm. the roadblocks, why are we getting the orders, and then make a kind of an assessment on like is this a product issue, 
is it a market issue? Is it a pain issue? Is it a positioning issue? Right. And, and then, you know, be very candid with the entrepreneur about like what I think are the challenges uh, to kind of solving these issues. You definitely talk a lot about the mistakes that you've made. You talked about that in the popping the bubble episode, but yeah, being comfortable with that. Is that something that you just tend towards anyhow and have honed over the years or, you know, like I, I know like the reason why I'm good at war is because I've screwed a lot of things up, you know, and, and just catastrophically failed at things to go, don't do that anymore, you know, but how, how did you get to be so comfortable with your fallibility and, and, rein that in but yet still be able to succeed because you'll take on a crazy idea like better works and you're like yeah this is going to work you know i think it's just it's unfortunately it's experience (laughs) and you know like you know the more success you have the more challenges you have you know and the more learnings you have and i think that's just you know we all have our kind of like you know uh life learnings and struggles and and so I think it's just better to be like open about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think a younger me was maybe more, you know, kind of arrogant and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, more about myself. And I think, you know, with more experience, you just, you learn that it's, you know, there's other people involved in, <laughs> yeah. and the bigger picture. And I think that, you know, part of the ways that I can, you know, uh, practice, you know, my own humility is by you know trying to give back and helping and and um you know like one thing i did try to really make sure that i did was like for the 45 minutes that like everybody had my full attention right like like and that's really hard to do like to be extremely efficient and purposeful really try to get to the heart of the problem in 45 minutes or less yeah you know, and solve some fundamental issue, like a, have a breakthrough, have a break, like a, a breakthrough is, is a really hard thing to do. And it takes, I think, a lot of focus in order to do that. And I tried, I, I didn't always do it, but I, I, I think I did accomplish it, uh, you know, a reasonable number of times as well. Tell us about a time when you accomplished a breakthrough and you really hit home for you. Oh, let me, let me think. Um, I mean, there, you know, it, by the way, they're all like, like they're all like circumstantial, right? They're, they're, right. they're kind of to that particular company. So, you know, but, um, okay, I can think of a couple. Like, uh, so one was um, a, a company that uh, I think I, I'm actually really excited about. I think they're going to be a fantastic success. And, you know, they asked me this fundamental question is like, should we do X for life sciences? Mm hmm or X for hospitals or because we're thinking, kind of thinking like we're just going to do X for all of like healthcare and life science, like uh, for everything. We're going to a very broad platform. Mm-hmm. You know, my advice was to be um, to choose an industry, a, a very specific industry. And the trigger here was I started talking to them and they said, oh, well, we have some customers that do that use us in the pharmaceutical business. We have some customers that use us in the in hospitals and to me that was like a there was like a real issue here like a red flag of have we really we need to make a choice as a company what we're going to really be great at and pharmaceutical customers and hospital customers are very different in their needs we basically made a decision you know uh, we don't have to go into the details here but we made a decision that we're going to on which vertical we were going to focus on okay and go really deep in that vertical and own that vertical. Yeah. And to me, like that's a like that's a breakthrough, you know, thing. Because would you rather have like two half products, two serving two types of markets, or oh, one really great product, you know, serving you know one massive industry? And it, by the way, part of this was like actually in their case, choosing any of the verticals that they were considering uh, was was already going to be uh, infinite because like the verticals themselves were so great, right? And and, and big, right? So I don't know. Like that's kind of like that's kind of a boring example, I guess, maybe. But it's kind of it, there. It was. I'm like not about, bored. I think it's great, <laughs> man. <laughs> All right. It's kind of like this horizontal versus vertical kind of idea. Yeah. And, yeah. And I do think, like in this case, focus when you can actually focus on something already really big and be known for that one being the best at that. Yeah. I, I felt like that was like a breakthrough. And and just the second one. This is kind of a uh, maybe a smaller one. It was more of a a, a people issue somebody was having. Where they have a board member on, you know, that they're 
that was really problematic for them. They're yeah. disruptive. They are kind of creating a lot of noise and not being very helpful and and value added. And and this was a first time CEO, very business experience uh, leader, but first time CEO. And um, what we did was we had to like we you know, I, the, my my advice to them was you don't want to kind of call this person out and say like you know they're a board member and you know you don't want to kind of damage the relationship by saying you I don't find your interaction with me helpful Pete. Mm-hmm. that's not going to be productive <laughs> and one thing I try what I what I remember I said to them was look the key thing to remember is that you're the hero of this story you're not the villain right you're the hero of the story and so the hero doesn't go and kind of tell the board member that you know like oh I don't like how we're working together and blah 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 and this is not productive it, so that they have to remain the hero and, you know, and I said, why don't you proactively go to them and say, you know, I really uh, value the, you know, time and feedback that you, that you, um, that you share with us. But what I want to do is I want to put it on a, on a schedule, a 90 day schedule, uh, so that we can actually make sure that we kind of do it like an, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, whatever we need, two hours. We're going to do a deep dive and kind of get all your questions answered all at one time. And we're going to kind of, if you want to ha- add questions, you know, and don't send them an email, let's put them in a document, mm-hmm. but basically neutralize this board member. Right. And, and, you know, he, he said, well, you know, sh- can I just get rid of, or can, can I get rid of him? Can I, can I, you know, and I, I was like, no, you're the hero. Yeah. It, it's, you already made the mistake of getting them on your board. So that's that you're stuck with that. <laughs> right. You own your mistakes, but now neutralize them so that they don't disrupt you between the other 90 days that, the, the reality is the tax that you're going to have to pay for the mistake you made is a two hour session every 90 days. Right. But at least you don't have to deal with them for the other 89 days of the, you know, in the period. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. That's great. I mean, that is a great realization that this is, this is what it costs to get rid of this person and you're not supposed to like it. It's a mistake and you have to pay for it. It's going to hurt, but you can take this, this two hour, uh, this two hour, every couple of weeks thing. And then, direct i love the idea of directly putting it on that person like let's get through this let's figure it out let's schedule it so we can look otherwise you know you'll continue to circle back circle back circle back and but yeah like uh, neutralize the problem sure. but still realize that you probably have to pay a tax yeah it's like a stupidity tax <laughs> letting them on the board that's yes. the tax. yeah you're paying for the uh the lesson here so okay yeah. uh, here's what i really want to do now as we get close to the end here is it's the new year and there's people that are back in their car. They, you know, they started. They had goals last year. Maybe they did write them down. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they accomplished some of them. But some of the people that listen to this show either are or they know someone who's like, I can't take it anymore. I have got to get this idea out of my head. I've got to make this jump. But they don't know. They don't know a Chris, and they don't know a guy that you know can can help them raise money and everything. But that person you know, needs to do something and that they're just not, they're paralyzed by a lack of, of they're comfortable where they're at, but they hate it. They want to move on. How does that emerging entrepreneur take the next step or the next 10 steps? What, what, are, what do you want to say to them as they're driving in traffic, waiting to go to their life that they can't stand? So I, I guess the, what, what goes through my mind is if somebody is ready uh, and and prepared to really go through the ups and downs of becoming an entrepreneur, and and it, by the way, which is a you know tremendous sacrifice right. in terms of family time, savings, and and like maybe like life work life balance and stress. Let's just say you're willing to overcome those. And by the way, not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. That's right. Just the on, on the positive side, I do believe it's becoming easier to become an entrepreneur because there's so many tools and technologies and resources available to us about how, like how to learn and grow and develop a company and meet other people to join our team and, and find access to investors if we're having success. And so there's, there's, there, this has never been a better time to start a company. And then I think the question really just becomes, it's a, it's a function of like, what's your confidence level? in making the leap and have you been rigorous in your diligence to really validate that this is going to be a great not just idea but business Mm -hmm. and and then finally do you have the resources to enable you to take the leap 
in a way that um, will give you enough time to prove this out. And the good news is, is the worst, the worst that can happen is you just have to go and get another job. Right. That's the, like the worst. Right. And so that's, I think that's a pretty, that's actually a pretty comforting thing that the worst that I'm going to do is I have to go back and be like, you know, get in the traffic again on the, on the drive to work. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the best that could happen is you could have like a, a grand slam and, you know, and then there's many, many other outcomes in the middle as well. Um, yeah, for sure. So, so I think there's a lot of calculus that goes into it. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you mentally ready? Do you have confidence in the business idea and the ability to create a business? Do you have access to resources and savings uh, and family for support? And, you know, but, you know, 2019, it's never been a better year to start a company. And it's, you know, and, and, and there's just so much potential out there for helping people and creating a great business at the same time that, um, that I would encourage people to do it if they're able to address those earlier comments. Give us an idea, work-life balance. I know that as a podcaster, I put out a ton of content and I work, I would say I work on average 84 to 100 hours a week, every week just because that's just what it takes for me to get my business off the ground. Um, what do you think is a real, like when you were talking to this person who's sitting in their cube and they're like, oh man, I don't know how hard it work. How, like I always say, I'm, I'm my worst boss. Like if you hate your boss now, wait till you meet your new boss and it's you, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really <laughs> hard. But uh, what are we talking about time-wise? So I don't think you have to have a, a massive sacrifice uh, in that regard, I think there is a there is a sacrifice, but I don't think it's a massive sacrifice. Um, and my guess is my my workday is probably like you know eight to six in the office, mm-hmm. home for dinner, and then a few more hours of work you know, after dinner. And you know probably like five or six, you know sometimes seven, but my, mostly five or six days a week. Right. So I, I don't I don't think that, I don't feel like that's a massive sacrifice. I do think that like. Some of it is like you're thinking about work when you're not actually working and you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea or a stress that you have to kind of deal with. Yeah. You know, this employee, I have to coach them on this issue or this, I'm dealing with this customer contract or, you know, like the, the ups and downs. And I think that's kind of some of the other work-life impact that sure. the, str- the stress can have. But, but I also find that like, I, you know, in my first startup in 1999, I remember that we used to take sleeping bags to work and we would spend the night at the office because it was really about demonstrating how much sacrifice you could have for the company. Yeah. That company was not successful. <laughs> um, and you know, that always kind of left a message with me that like the folks that are like working so many hours a day, yeah, uh, like you have to kind of question that what's the diminishing returns on that productivity and, and versus being like well rested, getting right, the right sleep, you know, having family time. I've right. got two two sons. They're they're going to be leaving high school soon, and so it's time to you know this is like the best time to kind of you know yeah spend time with the family. And so I, I I do think that there's a lot of stress that's created, but I don't feel like I think you can create a, a model where you can be home for dinner and still and still have a startup. But either way, even if you're doing the six six twelves, you're talking seventy two hours a week. So for someone that's working forty hours, we are talking. You know, you you know the the places where the work needs to be more than someone who doesn't. So a seventy six hour work week, maybe it's eighty. It's still you know, and sometimes seven days a week. It's still a significant difference for someone who's used to eight to eight to four, eight to five with the hour. But you know what? Work. I find that like a lot of these folks that work, you work in a big company. Yes, they also, they're working super hard too. They're not. Yeah, they are not. This, working in a big company is not a, is not easy. Yeah, um, no, I'd, I'm glad that you in the said time, that. They're doing the conference calls in the morning, six in the morning and at 10 o'clock at night and supporting the Asian office and supporting the uh-huh. South American location. And yeah, so uh, uh, I, I believe it's a misnomer that, you know, startup has a huge hours and a big company doesn't. I think everybody's just working all the time anyway. Okay. I want to just real quick ask you about really, cause I know we're running out of time, but um, I wanted to ask you about your Porsche. How often are you getting into that thing and racing it? Uh, I, so I drive it every weekend okay. um, on the 280, <laughs> <laughs> and I, t- I do about 12 track days a year. Okay. Uh, with it, and mostly at Laguna Seca, but I also uh, track at uh, Thunder Hill and Button Willow. Yes. I haven't done Sonoma Raceway yet, uh, 
just because I've kind of been racing on those three tracks. Yeah, yeah, it's got a V8 in it. So it I love a, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got, it, 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 the, the standard configuration is about 240 horsepower, and with, with the motor that I've got in it, it's about 410 horsepower. Yeah. Um, so the car just it just it, it goes, and it's got way more potential than in my driving ability. Yeah, uh, that's always the case, right? Yeah. And how fast are you getting around Laguna Seca? Are you like a buck forty-two, or how fast are you going around? Yeah, one forty-three. Okay. Is my time right now. And I, I think it could do thirty-nine. Uh huh. But I think I just got to get more, a little bit more confidence with it. But yeah, one forty-three is my best time. And then where do you think you, uh, obviously every corner, but what corner you're like, I just can't get two figured out. You know, it, it changes every time I go out there. <laughs> I think, I actually think all, like all the corners I could be exiting at maybe an extra five miles an hour. Right. You know, it's, it, there's a point where it's not just about pushing harder. It's about changing your approach. Okay. And kind of rewiring your approach. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I'm working on next is like, you know, it's not just about like push harder. It's, you know, maybe I, maybe I want to break a little earlier so I can get on the gas sooner and yeah. I want to fundamentally change where my braking, braking area is. So I, these are like things that I'm kind of working on right now, but I, I'm pretty sure I can get my, my, if I could get to 139, 140, uh-huh. I, I would be very happy with, uh, with, you know, with, with my driving. And what's your favorite corner of Laguna Seca? I personally, I love six because our car, we've got a super with the V8 stuffed in it. And uh, you, you kind of just roll off the gas and then just get right back in it. As soon as you dare to, the car, you know, just gets mad and slides sideways and rockets up that hill. And all you smell is rubber behind you. And it's just, oh my gosh, I love that corner. But what what's your favorite corner? Yeah, well, yeah you, there's that, that you have to hook it into that really, that dip. Yes. Right? On the way up, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I like I like that turn. Um, I, one thing I have to be careful of is on the right hand side there. There's a microphone box. Yes, right, right before coming up the hill there, and uh, <laughs> yeah. my car is about a hundred decibels. Oh, that's way too loud. <laughs> and so I, I have to. I actually have to put Laguna pipes on the on the exhaust that point the exhaust away from the microphone box. Right, sound box, yeah. and uh, then I have to go all the way to the left, and I have to lift. Uh-huh. Uh, and if I do those three things, then um, then I won't get a flag for for noise. Yeah. All right. Well, I won't bug you about any more race car stuff. I know uh, uh, I could talk about these things all day long. Um, if if you're interested, and we race our car. We actually had a guy that broke his neck, and so he, we're waiting for him to get through all his lawsuit stuff. And as soon as he's done, we're going to get back in our car. But if you're interested, we'll, we'll put you in the car on the track at Sears Point. It's not quite as fast as your car, but it's comparable. It's uh, it, it's it's ridiculously fun. And uh, we go out, we race lemons, so it's like four hours, uh, you know, or eight hours out there every day, two hours still usually but you are racing next to someone who's like i want this from my company <laughs> you know like uh, yeah, that'd be fun yeah i'd, I'd love to do that it's yeah, a right, I, I, haven't right. Done a, I haven't done a lemon yet and i'd love to do that yeah yeah and we may also go out to utah for lucky dog same kind of thing as that just a little bit more more racy than uh than crazy uh, uh traffic fest like that lemons is but hey listen seriously thank you that was awesome i know that people enjoyed it because it's it's it, it's just neat to be able to spread things like you share a company now with warriors and hall of fame musicians and all kinds of other people but this is this is life and this is what we do yeah it was great Pete. thanks for the opportunity